Adam really means the daughters of Cain, not Seth. And the sin that uh, is, is dominant there is their failure to maintain separation, is the concept. Now, it doesn't explain how the offspring of these unions resulted in these strange creatures. You know, if you have a believer and unbeliever marry, they may have monsters, but not, they're not monstrous. Okay. Um, this whole view of the so-called lines of Seth emerged in the 5th century in the early church. Celsus and Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief. See, this belief that I've shown you was taught by the ancient rabbis in, in the Old Testament period and also taught by the early church up through the 5th century. But Julian, uh, Celsus and the, uh, Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief to attack Christianity. They made fun of these people who thought the angels had so forth. They attacked it. Julius Africanus resorted to this Sethite idea as a more comfortable ground. It's more, people find that more, less spooky. And uh, it just, uh, Cyril of Alexander used it to repudiate the Orthodox position. Augustine comes along, who was a profound influence, and he did many, many great things. He dealt with a number of heresies, but he embraced the Sethite series, and that, of course, uh, made it uh, Orthodox. And so this view of this line of Seth prevailed all through the medieval church. It isn't until you go back to the text and do your homework that you begin to realize that the line of Seth has absolutely no scriptural support. The text itself, the sons of God is never used of believers in the Old Testament. That, that, that's contrived. Seth was not God. Cain was not Adam. The sons of God are not the sons of Seth. And uh, the daughters of Adam were not just the daughters of Cain. Or both. That if you recognize, recognize the first two verses are one sentence, a lot of that becomes very obvious. And if, if there's daughters of men, where are the daughters of Elohim? There's, if there's sons of Elohim, where's the daughters of Elohim? See, you sort of wonder, what, 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 there's no mention of that. The grammatical antithesis is ignored, and I won't get to that here. But this idea of maintaining separation doesn't occur until chapter 11 of Genesis, not 6. It's five chapters later that we have the Babel and all of that. The separation is imposed upon Isaac and his following, not on Ishmael or the others. It was Isaac and Jacob that were told to keep themselves separate. And that was not imposed on Seth and Cain. That's all contrived. In fact, Genesis 6, verse 12 says, All flesh was corrupted. So the idea that lines of Seth were the good guys and the line of Cain was the bad guys is contrived. That's not what it's all about. See, the inferred godliness of Seth is contrived. Why was only Enoch and Noah's eight spared? Were they only good guys? No, it's God's grace, of course. They took wives that they chose, implies some forcing functions here. And if that's all, if they, Seth were such good guys, why did they perish in the flood? Doesn't, see, it doesn't, doesn't compute. And uh, it, Enosh, it was incidentally Enosh's Seth's son that initiated the defiance of God. Most people don't realize that because of mistranslation. Genesis 4.26 should read, Then men began to profane, not call upon, profane the name of the Lord. So renders the Targum of Onkelos, the Targum of Jonathan, the major Hebrew rabbis, Karp Rashi, uh, Maimonides, and the rest, and of course, Jerome. So, the daughters of Cain, this, this is not a subset of the daughters of Adam, there's no basis for that. And the Cainites were not necessarily godless. You know, I've always wondered in Genesis 4, why we have the genealogy of Cain. Because they're going to all perish in the flood. Why does the scripture give us the genealogy? Well, there may be other reasons, but one reason is, if you read the names, you'll find the name of God in them. You get the impression that Cain messed up, killed his brother, yes, but he raised his kids and grandchildren to worship God. He was a godly guy, and the names reveal that. So the idea that daughter, the, 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 you know, the, the descendants of Cain were bad guys is, is a contrivance of modern scholarship. And why are they just daughters of Cain? Were the daughters of Seth so unattractive? What's the deal here? So that's, of course... And, of course, the, the, the death knell to this theory is that the, 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 the unnatural offspring. What were the Nephilim then? See, the, they, were, they were supernatural offspring, the mighty men, the Geberim. Does that mean only X chromosomes among the Sethites? There are no women of renown recorded. And, and what really made Noah's genealogy so distinctive? It wasn't contaminated by this, this, these goings on. And as I pointed out, we have these New Testament confirmations. We looked at several of them, and I won't get into that here. The angel view was the traditional rabbinical view in the Old Testament. The Book of Enoch is just an example of their belief system, uh, emphasizes that. The Testimony of the Twelve Patriarchs, these are not inspired books, but they do reflect the thinking of the times. Jose Josephus clearly uh, understood this. The Septuagint clearly spells it out. The Church Fathers in the first few centuries, Philo, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and the rest of them, all taught this. 
Modern scholarship, Pember, DeHaan, McIntosh, Dillich, Gablin, Arthur Pink, Donald Barnhouse, who I respect highly, Henry Morris, Merrill Unger, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, terrific scholar, Hal Lindsey, Chuck Smith, others. Modern scholarship recognizes the angel view. The Sethite view is uh, the text itself destroys it, the inferred separation is nonsense, the inferred godliness is contrived, the inferred Canaanite substitute of the Adamites is not contrived, all this is contrived. The unnatural offspring implied is the death knell to the view in my view. And of course the New Testament, Jude and Second Peter, nail it. But there's another issue as I got into this, not just for this study, it's important for us to understand that the Nephilim were not confined before the flood. We don't know how they came about, but they were Nephilim after the flood, when, Josh, when uh, Moses sends in the twelve tribes. In Numbers 13, verse 33, they encountered the Nephilim in the, in the land. Who built the pyramids? That's yet another quick ancillary question here. Who built the pyramids? The Great Pyramid of Giza, the Stonehenge in Britain, and the Circle of the Rephaim in the Golan. And uh, they're up in the Golan Heights, there's an unexplored monument we discovered uh, up there that is called the Gilgal Rephaim. This is, who are the Rephaim? And uh, the, the, the Circle of Rephaim is five circles, 20 ton stones, about 155 meters in diameter. Dated to about 3000 BC, it's built on a flat plateau. And by the way, you can only detect its architecture from above, strangely, and so forth. Um, there's, there's some others, too, that are, if you fly over that area, you see the hints of others. These have never been explored. And uh, the point I want to get across, it's, it, it startled me to realize that this is not simply a study in Old Testament ancient history. It is essential to understand, if you're going to understand your Bible, and understand prophecy. You need to understand that there were Nephilim after the flood. In Genesis 4 it says there were, there were uh, Nephilim in those days and also after that. It even hints at it right there. In Genesis 14 and 15 we discover there are four tribes at least. The Rephaim, the Emim, the Horim, and the Zamzumim. That Joshua was instructed to wipe out every man, woman, and child. Boy, that sounds like genocide. It was. Because... We had the same thing, not a flood this time, it was a local situation. And uh, Arba, Anak, and his seven sons, the Anakim, are talked about not just in the Bible, but also in Egypt, by the way. They were encountered in Canaan, Numbers 13.33, when the, when the uh, twelve spies went. The, when they came back, the, Joshua and Caleb had the good report. The other ten guys said, hey, there's Nephilim in the land. That's the word they used. They were giants. We are like grasshoppers in their sight. That's not an exaggeration. They had reason to be terrified. Obviously, Joshua and Caleb had uh, faith in God. We're, you know, God's on our side, let's go. But, uh, and it's easy to disparage the other ten guys. You need to understand they had, on the one hand, some reason to be cautious. In Deuteronomy 3 and Joshua 12, we encounter Og, the king of Bashan. He's the king of the giants, the Rephaim. Goliath, remember, he had f four brothers. That's why David picked up five stones when he crossed the brook. Why? He was ready for all five of those guys. See, one of the things you can go through the whole Bible and study the Bible in terms of Satan's strategy to try to thwart the plan of God. And when God indicates that, the, that, it's, that the, his redemptive plan is going to come from the seed of the woman, he starts attacking Adam's line in Genesis 6 with the, with the Rephaim, which of course, I mean with the Nephilim. And that's uh, God's response, of course, to the flood. Genesis 12, when God calls Abraham, now Abraham is singled out. As God refines the visibility more precisely of how his plan is going to work, it allows Satan to focus his attack. When Abraham is called, Abraham gets singled out for Satan's uh, uh, mischief. The famine in Genesis 50, the destruction of the male line in Exodus 1, Satan's attempt to thwart the... Uh, even when they get out, Pharaoh's pursuit of, uh, of, in the Exodus. It was, um, now, when God calls Abraham, he tells Abraham in Genesis 17, 15 and 17, that he's going to leave there, and four centuries later, his descendants will come. Well, that lets Satan know he's got four centuries to lay down a minefield. And that's what we're dealing with here in the Rephaim in the land. And when God calls David in 2 Samuel 7, it allows Satan to focus on David. And uh, the attacks on David's line. Jerom kills his brothers in 2 Chronicles 21. The Arabians slew everyone but one, Azariah. Uh, uh, Athaliah kills all but Joash in 2 Chronicles 22. Every, every time there's an attempt to wipe out all the royal line, some servant hides a baby, whatever, there's always, uh, it slips through. And uh, Hezekiah, Isaiah 36 and 38, another example. 